All right, welcome back to the FitFile podcast where you're gonna hear about anything and everything sports tech related, whether that's sports watches, bike computers, bike trainers, train wraps, and anything that you can use to level up your health, fitness, and sports game. The two of us are Dez of DezFit on YouTube and myself, Ray of DC Rainmaker on both YouTube as well as DCRainmaker.com on the worldwide internets. Uh, focusing on sports technology stuff, as Dez mentioned, across all sorts of devices, whether it be action cameras or things that you wear um, or go on your bike or that you ride your bike on top of. <laughs> <laughs> your bike, ride your bike on top of okay yeah we're like gonna sport, leave that like a, like a trader <laughs> we're, we're gonna we're gonna leave that in there <laughs> all right so all right so on this episode we have a bit to talk about on the uh heart rate sensor front in terms of a few different products whether that's going to be the polar grit x2 pro as well as the new sennheiser momentum sport earbuds with a built-in heart rate sensor. There's some other heart rate bits that we'll talk about too. And then uh, Zwift also announced their Zwift Click for just 39 bucks. So I guess let's go ahead and start with that first. So the Zwift Click is a little accessory that's gonna be used for virtual shifting right now with Wahoo trainers. So go ahead and expand on what this little accessory is all about. Yeah, so the Zwift Click is a small, tiny little button, uh, basically kind of the next level, if you will, uh, for the Zwift Play, but not actually in like a more feature standpoint, but in terms of the next iterative uh, design. So the Zwift Play was something that went in your handlebars, had a bunch of controls for your um, bike to be able to control game in-game functions in Zwift. Uh, but that cost more, and it's kind of clunky in the grand scheme of things, which nothing wrong with that, has a lot more features. But the Zwift Click is this tiny little button, not much bigger than like a, a Euro or like a, a toonie, a Canadian toonie, if you will, um, in terms of size, uh, a little bit thicker. It has two buttons on it, and they do just one thing only. Well, each button does one thing, but for one button increases the resistance, and one button decreases resistance, uh, and it's effectively replacing shifting on your bicycle. Uh, so the idea behind this is that when you look at like how Zwift has to, uh, you know, distribute trainers and things like that out to the masses, uh, for many people listening to this podcast, they probably have a bike that is more than likely a 11 or 12 speed bike. That's, you know, bike in the, the last decade or so worth of stuff. Um, but they might also have a 10 speed bike. In fact, my triathlon bike is a 10 speed bike. Uh, my wife's older triathlon bike is a 10 speed bike. Uh, so the more different uh, cassette configurations you have, the more complex it is for trainer compatibility. And when you're trying to get new people into the sport, uh, having to have all the different trainer compatibility combinations, in other words, cassette combinations to sell, increases the amount of complexity for them as well as the end user. So by going to a what's called virtual shifting design, you get rid of shifting entirely on your bike. So you basically just put your bike on the trainer, you put it in a gear, um, and then you just leave it alone for the entire time. And you just use this little button to shift uh, up or down. That's basically how smart bikes have worked, indoor smart bikes now for the last couple of years. Uh, you know, that how that button is designed on an indoor smart bike varies quite a bit in terms of uh, how fancy they want to get. But at the end of the day, it's just a button uh, that's virtual shifting kind of behind the scenes uh, of that trainer. Now, the, the trick to this whole thing is that it's essentially tied to a given trainer model. Uh, and the reason why I had a really long, interesting kind of chat with Swift about this back a month or so when I went and visited them um, is that it's not quite as simple as just simply increasing or decreasing uh, gradient or resistance behind the scenes. There's a lot of kind of physics stuff they're doing to make it feel realistic and feel very, very efficient. That's why it's, you know, rolled out first on the uh, Zwift Hub, and then it kind of iterate to the Zwift Hub 1, and then the Kicker Core, and now the Kicker V6, and the Move, and they're working the way down for the V5 and the V4, and, and so on. Uh, so it's notable that this is now available for just 39 bucks at the same time that you can also go out and update your firmware for a Kicker V5 or V6. And the reason that this is kind of interesting that the Click is being uh, sold as a standalone for just $39 is that when the Wahoo Kicker Core, oh my gosh, that name, all right, the Wahoo Kicker Core Zwift 1? Yeah, I think I got that right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> when that came out, so that was basically retrofitting their COG plus click or Zwift's COG plus click solution onto a Wahoo Kicker core at that point. What's super interesting at that point though is that the number one request that I saw in the comments probably when that came out was the click accessory just being a standalone unit because the cog isn't actually necessary for this whole implementation for virtual shifting. Like the cog, uh, that is 
in my mind, a solution more for the bike manufacturer probably, or I'm sorry, the bike trainer yeah. manufacturer number one, yep. just because it reduces the complexity on their end of having to outfit different cassettes. But it also does help the end user as well, if especially if you live in a household with like multiple bikes or something like that, where you can easily switch between bikes and not have to switch out a cassette. So you don't have to switch out from 11 speed to a 12 speed, speed cassette. No, totally. And I think that's one of the, the biggest advantages are that it, of this entire system is that if you do have two different bikes of two different types, and like myself, I'm sure you as well, had different bikes that are 12 speed and 11 speed that are kind of floating around. Uh, this makes it really, really easy just to simply swap back and forth between those two uh, without having to do anything. Uh, and what's interesting about the cog is, you know, you kind of mentioned the cog is essentially just one single cog. Um, and I don't have one floating around here right now, but it's one single cog and you just put it in there and you kind of align things and you're good to go. Uh, but you don't need that. Like almost within those, you know, nine to 12 um, gears, you can find generally one gear that's going to be quiet um, no matter what bike you put on there and you just leave it in that gear and you're set. In fact, I would actually recommend not using the cog in for, for my testing. I found the cog to be louder than any cassette that I actually had on the trainer that was yeah. matched to my drivetrain because the cog, it's a it's a generic cog that doesn't have the exact profile of a cog that's going to be for your matched drivetrain. So I would encourage anyone to just use the cassette that's on there plus the virtual shifting accessory. So it, it's funny though, with the with the virtual shifting though, it definitely takes a while to get used to that, to not touching your own shifters, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it took me quite a few sessions to like use the click and not touch my shifters. Yeah, no, I agree. I think not only does it take some time to get used to, but there's also limitations there, right? You look at something uh, like any other application besides Swift, they don't support it today. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go ahead and uh, want to be able to shift in another application like Ruby or Be Cool or pick any application you want out there, this doesn't work with that today. And that is a bit of a a bit of a gap. So if you were to go out and buy just the cog version where it's the, that single cog plus this on your on your bike, then you can't go and use those other applications. Uh, versus if you leave a normal cassette on there and then just use this to virtual shift on top of that, then if you want to play the field, you can still go off and, and play the field. Now, I'll argue, though, that Although I think it's nice that they're offering the click for $39, the Zwift plays are still like on sale for 99 bucks. I think the normal price is supposed to be 150, but they're like been perpetually at $99 for a long yeah. time. I my personal suggestion would just be to get the play controllers because those offer a lot more functionality. They have the virtual shifting functionality built into those as well. You don't have to have the click. The it, you can actually do the virtual shifting with the play controllers, um, but there's just a lot more functionality, like being able to control a lot of aspects in the game, like navigation and stuff like that. For ninety nine versus thirty nine dollars, I don't know. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I totally agree. I think they're they're a much better overall solution in terms of just features. Um, the one caveat would be if you have like a, a triathlon TT bike, then that can be mm. a bit tough for fit. It just, it's going to really depend. Um, sure. You can kind of like make it work in some cases, but it's not great. Whereas this does allow that a little bit easier. Um, I think for me though, just I would stay with some sort of click or play versus something else. Um, I will say though, like generally speaking, I find it interesting that this is sort of the direction where that we want to go in, like in the sense that, you know, if you think about when smart bikes are first introduced, like the, the tax Neo plus, uh, smart bike, um, you know, the watt bike, uh, Adam, et cetera. Um, everyone saw those first gen bikes, the first kicker bike. Uh, and we looked at them and said, Oh, it's cool. But the shifters weren't super awesome with the exception of the kicker bike had like amazing shifters, right? And like the mm. whole idea was to get to realism in shifting. And now we saw that with the, the Tax Neo Bike Plus, they upgraded the shifter design to make it more realistic. Um, we've seen the Stages bike, of course, as well. Stages SB20 had really nice shifter design. And now it feels like we're going backwards. Like we're going from what is realistic shifting. Like it feels realistic. It feels really good. And this is really fast. Don't get me wrong. The, the shifting on the, the click is very, very fast, but it's just not as realistic. So I don't understand in my, my little brain as to why we like unless you have a problem with compatibility i still prefer to manually shift to be honest like i just like the feeling of that in a bike because it feels more like the outdoors opposed to feeling like just pressing a little rubber button yeah uh no i totally agree it's it we it definitely feels like we're regressing a little bit but 
I guess there is another use case for the click and the virtual shifting, and that's going to be with certain types of drivetrains. So, uh, you, you know, with certain types of drivetrains, even like with a one by gravel uh, type drivetrain. So on a normal cassette configuration on something like that, you're going to be talking about like an 11 to 42, or, you know, you could go like the mullet style, like 11 to 50, you know, stuff like that, where you actually have a large gap in between your gears where you may not be able to find your correct cadence. So that's one possible solution for, or one possible reason to get these uh, virtual shifting component. And then the other is going to be for like mountain bikes with very small front chain rings too, where you don't actually have the proper gear spread that you would have with a road bike when you're riding on um, Zwift, just because, you know, the simulation is really going to be more for road bike type simulation more than mountain bikes, where with yep. the virtual shifting with a mountain bike, you actually do have your full spread at that point. Right. No, that makes makes total sense. So it's good to see the pricing is reasonable in this. I think 39 bucks is, is very, very reasonable in the same way that mm -hmm. 99 bucks for the play is very reasonable. Yeah. I think 150 for the play. Um, it's tough to justify for a lot of people. I mean, I get it that if you're using it every day, then cool, right? That's that's a whole different thing. But um, I think for a lot of people, that 150 would have been tough. And it's good to see that it's never gotten there. It's always stayed at 99. <laughs> now, one last thing I think we should talk about with the click accessory with the virtual shifting is other trainer brands other than Wahoo. So... So yeah, that's an interesting, interesting discussion. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> when when this first came out, I asked Zwift that, um, and I said, "Hey, what's your plan there? Is this only going to be a a Zwift Wahoo Play, or are you going to open this up to other companies?" And they said at the time their intention was to open it up to other companies. And when I met with them uh, a month ago, um, it sounds like that follow through is indeed happening. And I can't get into all the details there, but um, I have kind of confirmed with other companies as well that that follow through is happening behind the scenes. Um, I don't think we're going to see that like tomorrow, but it's also not probably going to be a next year thing either, right? It's going to be somewhere in between that that range, but things are moving. It'll be interesting to see what uh, what that movement looks like when it finally like lands on some of these other companies, but it does sound like there are other companies uh, both on the app side as well as on the um, hardware side that are looking to uh, to integrate there on this. So um, that could be really interesting. I hope that if they, if they do want some sort of standard communication to come out of this, that they do find a way to have that handed off, not necessarily handed off to a body because that's kind of a messy thing right now because there really is no great, you know, middleman there. Like you look at AM plus, you look at Bluetooth smart, but uh, that's just a whole different topic for a whole different day in terms of where to put something like this from a standard standpoint. But I hope that whatever they do there, they make it a bit open source um, or at least open source ish in a way, in the same way that, you know, Wahoo and others have put their different protocols out there for people to access it. Even if they can't contribute back into it, they can at least um, access it relatively freely, which I think is, is good enough in this particular case. So we'll see totally. what happens there over the, over time. No, I think it's really cool uh, that they've certainly innovated with a couple of unique pieces of hardware for the indoor cycling space being more of a software company. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. No, I agree. Actually, before we go on, one quick note that this episode is sponsored by Precision Fuel and Hydration. I've been using their stuff now for a couple of years. In fact, also used it just last week on a crazy long hike that we referenced in the previous episode uh, when I mentioned I was going to go ahead and talk with their sports scientist to figure out how to fuel that hike. And I did indeed do that. Uh, we'll get into the hike a little bit later on in this episode. Uh, but it was really useful to be able to talk to those folks and have kind of ideas on uh, how to fuel that appropriately, both their stuff as well as mixing that with real food and that's a service they do for free like you can call them up uh, and basically talk to one of their uh, folks that are sports scientists about your race goal and they can kind of give you a bit of a nutrition kind of general guidance on how to get there now of course precision products are used by plenty of top pro athletes top tour de france teams nba teams nfl teams major league baseball teams uh, last year the tour de france on the women's side i showed some of how that worked as well um, super super cool stuff with that all of the products are informed sport certified vegan all are two one glucose fructose and contain no artificial ingredients and as i said before perhaps the most important thing is they're actually edible no problems out in the trail for 10 to 13 hours uh, consuming this stuff constantly it worked great you can visit the free link in the description for the precision fuel and hydration planner or get 15 percent off at your next order with coupon code fitfile thanks again to precision for supporting the podcast thanks guys all right, so that's the Zwift Click for 39 bucks. So next up, let's talk about, well, let's see here. I'm gonna go ahead and give you the option here. So we have two, options. 
interesting options to talk about. So we okay. can talk about the Grit X2 Pro, which has already come out at this point, but uh, we're wrapping up our final reviews. Got yep. some interesting findings there. And we also have the Sennheiser Momentum Sport earbuds with a heart rate sensor. Let's go, you, let's go Sennheiser. Let's, let's, let's Sennheiser. Just, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the Sennheiser Momentum Sport earbuds. So these have, uh, you know, all the amazing Sennheiser sound quality stuff. They're great, great earbuds. But the unique thing about them is that they have a built-in heart rate sensor, body temperature sensor. And probably the most unique thing is that they have like seamless integration with the Polar Flow ecosystem. I've already tested them and reviewed them. Uh, you can go and check out my review, but uh, let's go ahead and get your thoughts on these <laughs> at this point. Yeah, so my review should come out. It'll be a race to see who's who's out first. This podcast or my written review. I don't plan to do a video mm. review. It just it's not not fitting into my my week or or life plan right now. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think and I Des's video review covers pretty much all my thoughts in general. Anyway, so I'm going to focus on the written review and I'm going to focus really on uh, some of the nuances of the heart rate accuracy and some of the temperature bits on it. Uh, but nonetheless, all of my like data gathering phase is done now. So it's really just a case of me making this review look somewhat cohesive and then uh, publishing it. So I agree with Des's, you know, general thought there that the audio quality is great, um, really, really good. Um, I'm really happy with that. I'm not like an audiophile, but I'm in the camp of I can generally tell if something sucks or not, and this this does not suck, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I kind of working down our list here, uh, working down my mental list. Uh, opening the case up, I hate all things to do with the case, um, <laughs> like. Every aspect of this ha case I hate. Uh, even this like morning, that, by that, the way. You don't like that floppy little, like, sad cover. Uh, it's it, like, Des is going to have to go shoot some B-roll for how sad this is. Like, the, the whole <laughs> top of the case is like a bad convertible on, like, a V-Dub bug or something. Like, it just kind of, like, <laughs> flops flops everywhere. I'm like, what are you doing? Um, and then it's also too big for just the pods to go in. So the pods, you got to play, like, 14 directions when you put them in. Um, if you have the other what do you call it, the the wings and stuff like that on there then it then it kind of snaps the right way but i find that's like just messy you gotta have the wings man like for security like yeah <laughs> mine don't fall off I've, I've been out for like a three hour ride now it's great that's good um, All right. <laughs> but uh that so that setting that aside um no problems with running and i ran again today and a bunch of other runs uh running or riding in them and following out everything's been Great there. Um, back on the case, though. By the way, I opened up the case this morning after my ride, I guess, 48 hours ago, um, and they stunk, which is really weird. I've never had headphones stink. Like, it stunk real bad. Like, I was like, <laughs> like you put, like, dirty socks in there, and I'm like, what is going on in this? I've huh. never had that happen before on a pair of headphones. I mean, That's interesting. I don't know what's going on with that, but that, that was a weird, like, definitely, like, sweaty, musty smell, which... I mean, I don't think I put them in that wet, but who knows? Either way, still, it was weird. Um, so sound quality, fine. <laughs> Connectivity sound has been really good. So to my phone, I've been put, using my phone, uh, mostly playing with it and putting my phone in my pocket, either the back pocket for cycling or in my running pockets. No problems there either. Um, but then that ultimately gets us to its main feature, um, which is the integration of Polar Flow as an app as well as the optical heart rate sensor and the uh, heart rate sensor. And so, as Des mentioned, it's integration with the Polar Flow app. It's basically designed to be like a Polar Flow, sorry, Polar, a uh, Polar heart rate sensor in that in that respect. And so um, when you open up the Polar Flow app, it's paired into it. You see it listed there as a heart rate sensor. It pulls in data, both the heart rate data, just like really any other heart rate strap would, but also this new uh, body temperature sensor data as well. Uh, and then it records it into the Flow app. You can also then record in your GPS location or not if you're indoors. And all that is super clean and super smooth and it works relatively great. Um, you don't actually have a ton of customization though on the data fields that you would see in the app. App. And by customization, I mean any whatsoever. Um, you you basically can turn whether or not you want training zones displayed. Um, but other than that, there's no like changing data fields. But again, there are many other apps out there that you can change data fields on other devices. And so it's not really a, a deal breaker. So connectivity to the um, to my phone had no dropouts, which was really good from a um, music standpoint. Uh, though today during my run from a heart rate standpoint, I had a brief couple moments where for like 10 seconds at a time, it dropped out heart rate. And it actually would tell hmm. me 
um, heart rate lost. And then like 10 seconds later, heart rate required or whatever the wording was, um, hmm. which was the first time I'd seen that happen. Uh, yeah, so, I've never seen, yeah, I've never experienced that actually. Yeah, so that's far. the first time in, hmm. in a couple weeks I've seen that happen. But uh, so I'm not super worried about that. Um, what's more problematic is the heart rate accuracy though. Uh, and you know, it's funny. I started off like, like a lot of things, sometimes easy stuff, right? I started off an indoor Peloton ride. That was a recovery ride after my hike, right? So it was like, I just want to see if my legs could still churn. Um, and relatively easy. I end up, of course, as Des and I always do, getting, you know, a bit too rambunctious in the middle of the ride, increasing the intensity and all sorts of stuff, right? But it actually tracked reasonably well for that. So I was I was pretty happy with that. Um, and then I did a trainer road ride that was reasonably challenging, and it did a good job on that indoors again there. Um, and then I went outside. And it all went to crap. And so like outside um, from a uh, heart rate standpoint on the bike for whatever it was, a couple hours, uh, it was just, I did intervals and it just completely like a, a child drawing a line across a paper would have been more accurate than this. Um, and then on today's run, uh, also intervals, the same thing, just completely like basically useless from a, a heart rate accuracy standpoint with any sort of outside usage or intensity. For running for me, it was an extremely consistent cadence lock issue that I found. And, you know, I, I don't want to ruin it for Ray's review, but if you've watched my review, I did a specific cadence test where I was specifically increasing and decreasing my cadence just to see how it would act. It was like spot on with my yeah. cadence the entire time. And I don't know, it, I guess... Maybe this is just a limitation with this kind of technology. So, I mean, you know, this is an optical heart rate sensor, just like you'd find on a watch. Same thing that you'd find on like an armband, like Polar's uh, uh, Verdi Sense armband. And then we have stuff in the ear. So, you know, wrists or optical heart rate sensors in general, they're good, but they are going to have limitations depending on the location that you're that you're actually wearing them. So maybe this is just a, a limitation with ear technology. I mean, we have seen this technology from like Samsung and Braggy before in the past. It's really never taken off, but maybe this is just one of those things with like, there's basically only certain things that it can do in certain situations. And what's interesting to me, though, is that every time I've talked to these companies, including Braggy and including uh, all the different companies that have tried optical sensors over the last decade, like all my conversations at the CESs of the world, and I feel like this is even part of the conversation with um, Sennheiser as well, is they always say somewhere in that entire like presentation, they're like, the ear is the best place to measure heart rate optically, and it's the most accurate place, and this and that. But it's never panned out. Like every single conversation, these companies say that. And then you get to like push comes to shove. And it's like, well, this is just a hot mess. So that's the accuracy, the heart rate side. I do want to briefly circle back though on the audio side. Um, I, you're going to dive into more like the audio quality aspects, I think. But from a wind reduction standpoint, I was out on Saturday. Um, it was 50 kilometer hour, like sustained winds plus gusts. And I was riding both into them and with them, using them as like a smart trainer outside. Um, and in the wind cancellation mode, the music was awesome. Like no problems at all. Um, however, if you went to pass through mode or, uh, transparency, transparency mode, transparency, yeah, completely. I couldn't do like more than two <laughs> no. seconds. It was like a hurricane in my head. It was like, Oh my God. Even today I tried briefly. It's also windy today. It's it's, I sent as a clip earlier today of like <laughs> literally a table flying past my, my studio. It's very, very windy out. Um, but even on my run, I couldn't do transparency mode. I tried for a couple seconds and it was completely useless. But in terms of wind reduction mode running, it was awesome. I was super happy with that. Yeah, no, I and, the, and in all fairness, the transparency mode on the Sennheisers is is pretty much like any other earbud out there, quite frankly, because, you know, transparency, what it's doing is that these earbuds are literally using their own microphones to pipe in outside sound. Uh, so, you know, it feels like you're actually hearing the outside as well as the audio that's being piped through the actual, uh, your music and stuff like that. So, you know, it's gonna pipe in the wind at that point. But yeah, you're right. The anti-wind mode mode is absolutely phenomenal on these. It's, it's by far the best I've experienced with any earbud. The unfortunate thing though, is that the anti-wind mode, it's a variant of the 
active noise cancellation mode and not a variant of the transparency mode, which what right. that means is that it's actually blocking out outside sound, which doesn't make it useful for, uh, you know, situations where you're outside windy and you actually want to hear your surroundings, like let's say cycling. Yep. No, exactly. That was a thing is I'd, I'd really hoped to be able to use the transparency while road riding. I just, mm -hmm. I couldn't, um, in my case, I was lucky in that where I was doing the intervals was basically like a little dedicated bike path near the airport with nothing there. So it was one of those, like I was in a very safe zone and I didn't have to worry about other people, but I wouldn't normally, I don't normally ride with headphones outside. I just, it's not my cup of tea, um, from like a safety standpoint, but yeah, I definitely wouldn't use this. You can't hear much, like, especially on my run today, it was very difficult to hear, anything else around me um you know no matter what was going on and luckily because the weather was so miserable like no one else is out there even my cars were like no um so it kind of worked out but uh yeah it was tough otherwise to hear um now we gotta get to the other feature though which is the uh temperature body temperature side of it um mm -hmm. so looking at that and that's something that they kind of put out there as a headliner feature and the way this works is again just like the heart rate once it's in your ear you can see your body temperature um just like a doctor would give not give uh measure your body temperature uh, from your ear with a little sensor thing jig. Um, you can see it both in the Sennheiser app um, called Smart Control, which by the way is a horrible name for their app. I'm like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Smart Control feels like it's a home automation thing, but whatever. Exactly. Um, and then, or you can see it in the Polar Flow app and the Polar Flow app will display it in real time. It'll display the maximum value and then record it into the Polar Flow uh, mobile app. You cannot though see it on the Polar Flow website, which is kind of a, a bit of yeah, a weird gap. Notice that. Um, and it does not appear to have exported out unless you found a way to see it in any data exports. I have not seen that. Uh, you can, however, see it in uh, the Grit X2 Pro as well as the Vantage V3 as well, though. Right, correct. But, you can see both of those, yeah. But not previous Polar watches, so. Correct, those two. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my testing, one, it's any time that we can't export out data, it makes our lives much more difficult. Um, so I was using, I think you were as well, the core body temperature um, sensor as kind of a vague reference. And one can debate the accuracy of that, but at this point, 19 of 21 um, men's world tour teams use them and about the same number on the women's side. And it's been pretty well validated across the board uh, for most scenarios as like, uh, very trusted in this realm. Um, so using that as a general proxy anyways, um, they trended together, but they were not the same temperature. Um, hmm. And, you know, I think you talked about this in your review that ultimately they are measuring two different places on your body. So um, one, the core body temperature sensor basically hooks onto your uh, heart rate strap, essentially. So it's going to be on your chest generally um, versus this is obviously in your ears. Um, and even Corazon's website has an entire like neat little table chart that shows accuracy at different places and kind of offsets and stuff like that. Now, did you have you gone to the trouble of going to a doctor or finding an in-ear uh, temperature measurement tool? Because that's that's something I did not get around to with this review. I mean, this is one of those rabbit hole type things that we are notorious for getting into. Yeah. But uh, so, I was, I'm, did you actually go to that trouble? I haven't. We actually have one for like the kids, right? That is yeah. CE certified. Um, so okay. it'd be medically grade certified. Um, Maybe I'll give it a whirl. Uh, one of the challenges, and you see this with um, uh, SpO2 sensing as well, right, is that the medical standard for some of these things, I don't know off the top of my head the medical standard um, for uh, body temperature. I'll have to go see what that, that variation is. Um, but it's not as accurate as we might necessarily hope sometimes to be able to get something mm. certified. I have not done that. I will go, maybe I'll give it a whirl just for fun, just to try it out uh, to see how that, that works. Um, I guess... My challenge with this, I think it's a cool idea. Like if this worked, it'd be cool. But one, you can't export it out in any meaningful way. So if I think about how how teams use the core body temperature sensor, right, um, today, uh, one, it's it's compatible with most of the different uh, device platforms out there, right? So it's basically ubiquitous, whether you're on a Garmin device or Wahoo device uh, app, like there's a gazillion ways you can see this data. The data goes into the app as well after the fact. So like it syncs there, you can download it. So team physiologists can download this stuff and team sports scientists can download this and analyze it and analyze it against performance. Those gaps are missing on this. Like if I was gonna use this and let's just assume it's accurate for the moment, we'll assume it's accurate if I was gonna use this, those gaps are missing. Thus, it becomes more of a toy than it does a tool from a training mm. standpoint uh, mm. because I can't actually leverage that data after the fact uh, versus the core one is very clearly like 
their you know, pricing, their everything is focused on, it's like 200 bucks, I think, or 170 or something like that um, for that. And that's focused on the sport science side of it. And that's the, the market they're trying to aim for. Sure. Yeah. It's, I don't know, uh, during workouts, I think it can be useful. So I did another workout the other day where, and I actually didn't include this with my review because I did this afterwards because I only thought about doing this sort of test afterwards was, um, so Ray knows me, like I, I actually don't like a fan at all during my indoor sessions. Like I, I love the heat. I love to sweat, you know, just like, I love that. But, uh, I did a uh, test specifically just to see what my body temperature would do, you know, after an hour of just like, you know, going hard and making sure that my body temperature increased and then, you know, putting a, uh, a headwind fan in front of me and, and really lowering, um, the ambient temperature. And it was pretty interesting to see that come down and my performance increase as my body cooled. So I think it could be useful in an in-workout scenario in certain situations. Um, I don't know, again, like, you know, in terms of the actual number, I basically saw it to be about one degree Fahrenheit off uh, between the core and the Sennheiser. So uh, it, as I got to higher temperatures, it started to, to increase, the gap started to increase a little bit to like 1.2, 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit sometimes, but it always trended well. It never wavered or anything like that. So there were never any spikes or drops in the temperature. So it was all very consistent. So I don't know. I think it's it could be interesting depending on what you want to get out of it. Uh, but I don't know. I think getting back to this product as a whole, though. So, you know, I think we're talking about, you know, three main things here. You know, we're talking about really, really good sound quality out of these. You're talking about the heart rate sensor. You're talking about the body temperature sensor. And then we have to kind of loop back to price. So, you know, these are $330, which is like absolutely at the upper threshold when it comes yeah. to premium uh, sports focused earbuds. And I own a lot of $300 earbuds myself. I'm, I'm, I am more on that audiophile side of things. And I will say that these are on par easily with like the top end Sony's that I have. I have some from Masters and Dynamic, which is another kind of audiophile company. And these are way up there in terms of audio quality. It's a smidge more in per terms of price too. So that kind of leads to, I wish they had a version without the heart rate sensor and body temperature sensor bits where, you know, these were just like really yeah. awesome sport earbuds. Sorry, I got distracted looking down the FDA website while you're talking. Um, <laughs> I found the document, but it's, it's obviously incredibly long. Uh, and yeah. the keyword searches are not finding the... It keeps referencing, it's just a, it's a rabbit hole of like, it links from one thing to the next. And it says, here's the, the table, go to the NIST thing. And the NIST thing then points to another page, which goes somewhere else. So I've started this rabbit hole. I will find out what the claimed FDA certification um, level is. Note that this is not FDA certified though, just to be clear. Um, oh, so totally, they've, made yeah. no, they've made no claims on these heart rate sensors, but I think it's interesting to note, right? Like if that's, if the whole point of this, um, of having this feature there is to be able to leverage it for temperature ranges, then in my mind, it should um, be within that realm as well. Uh, but I agree yep. with you. I think it's it's a good unit. I might just be a bit a bit highly highly priced. I don't know for for this meta for this athletic side of it. Um, yeah, I just wish the athletic side was a bit more flushed out. Like I think the polar flow integration, to be really clear, is well done, um, but. Polar still needs to export out that data, right? In my mind, this is the gap that Polar needs to do or someone needs to do to make that data exportable. If they can get there, that could make this, if it's accurate enough, really compelling for, um, you know, think about how many teams have their their riders on trainers and things like that um, doing stuff that this just, it's there, listening to music anyways, and it's good to go. Yeah. No, I think the one thing I will say in terms of the hard accuracy for the one type of activity where I did get shockingly good results was for weight training. And it's just, again, going back to the location of where the optical heart rate sensor is going to be located. So uh, wrist-based optical heart rate sensors just to have a hard time with this kind of activity because you're like gripping onto dumbbells, you're making all these kind of wild arm movements. And 
uh, basically that's going to uh, clench your wrist and that's going to affect blood flow, which in turn is going to lead to inaccurate results. So that's where with weight training, these have a distinct advantage being in your ears where you don't have to deal with that sort of variable there. So, so yeah, that's the one application where I think these could be useful from a heart rate standpoint. But again, I think it's going to be just challenging because of that $330 price tag. Um, so I guess, yeah, looping back to Polar and another topic. So we're going to talk about the Grit X2 Pro. See, so the Grit X2 Pro did come or it was announced, what, a month ago a month or so? Ago. Yeah, a month yeah, ago. And Basically a month by the time this comes out, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so basically they they announced it. We got to do kind of our you know first look at it because basically the software wasn't quite ready or the firmware wasn't quite ready for production. And they finally released their final firmware, I believe, last week. And we've been doing a whole bunch of testing with the new firmware. And uh, so what do you what are your thoughts so far? It's you know, it's better than it was two weeks ago. Um, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give them that. Um, mm -hmm. I think we got to kind of divide it in a couple of different areas. And so one of the things I'm talking about in my in my final review is that, and I don't know, I suspect this podcast will be up before my final review is my guess. Um, but uh, you've got you've got three or four days, I think. Yeah, you know, mm, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. It'll be it'll be a very close close call. But sure. Uh, I think there's sort of three different buckets, if you will. Uh, bucket number one is, does it, the newest features that are there, keeping in mind, remember as a, as a quick backstory here, both the Vantage V3 and the Grid X2 Pro are identical from an internal standpoint, from a software standpoint now. They're, the only difference is the external effectively case design, um, how it looks from the outside, and some small tweaks to the antenna due to said external case design, right? So every single watch that has a different case has a different antenna design because the antenna has to uh, accommodate said case. So, you know, when Polar talked about in, you know, improving the antenna design in the Grid X2 Pro, that was going to happen no matter what, um, because it was a different case design compared to the Vantage V3. Uh, but otherwise, Polar's intention, and it's not a bad thing at all, by the way, um, is to have the Vantage V3 and the Grid X2 Pro identical from a software features and internal hardware component standpoint. Battery, all that stuff is exact same battery, et cetera. So um, when you're talking about these, you're really just talking about different case designs. So that said, the, the Grid X2 Pro did get new software features as part of this. And so it's evaluating some of those new software features. So there's that slice of the pie. Like is the watch from a non, setting aside accuracy of heart rate and GPS, uh, is the watch functional? Do all those features work as behavior? Or as expected, etc. By and large, yes, but there are still some weird quirks. Like right now, a production quirk that is out on production watches that people have, there's an entire Reddit thread on it, is that sleep stages and phases disappears entirely for one night, two nights, three nights, and then it comes back for a few nights. And when that happens, you lose also the uh, sleep boost feature. You lose the, what's it called? Because mine's missing right now, the nightly recharge feature, the ANS feature, anything that's advanced from a sleep standpoint, other than what time you woke up, what time you went to sleep, and all the little times you almost woke up um, are gone. And Polar acknowledged this as a bug in the final firmware that wasn't there before. Like it wasn't, it worked fine for me for a month before. Um, so there are little bugs there. I think in some ways though, those little bugs are very similar to when the Instinct 2 came out a year ago or two mm. years ago, whatever it was, um, that there was like on the whole, the watch was good, but there were some little bugs that you're like, how did this make it through? Right. And this, that's that, that category there. Um, so the next section then in my brain anyways comes to accuracy and two core areas being the gps accuracy and the heart rate sensor accuracy starting off with gps i put it firmly in the camp of meh like um, just meh like it's not great it's not horrible my run today is a great example of meh um where i went out and the first portion of the run was through like the older parts of amsterdam so the some of the big parks like a vonda park which is akin to like a central park if you will um not hard from a gps standpoint and it was generally where i was supposed to be but sometimes it was like 20 or 30 meters off in the bushes right and it shouldn't have been there and then i went to the downtown area which is 30-story buildings and on some sections, it was good. In some sections, it cut across like four blocks for no particular reason, where other watches in the same price bucket, competitive range, et cetera, didn't. Um, they had no real issues there. So, meh, 
and GPS accuracy. And then we look at heart rate accuracy. And this to Polar's credit has improved with the final firmware release uh, about a week ago um, and notably improved. But I still have some like some activities where it just goes completely bad. Like, I don't know, like today's run was a good example of that where it was just super, super bad. Um, it missed entire intervals. It overshot intervals to 180 beats per minute and then stuck there even when I stood still for 30 and 40 seconds. Um, and that is where in theory, their new corrective thing should kick in where basically it will go back and say, oh, that was wrong. I will fix that in the file. I have dual recorded every single activity. Um, so basically every single one where I've recorded on the watch and then had it streaming the live data to an app where I could then see it. So I could basically compare and go, oh, the watch made this correction and it retroactively corrected things. But because I was streaming a copy of it, then I could see the the real, real some shady there. Um, never once has it ever corrected for me. Yep. No, that's the same for me. So I have been doing dual recording, you know, since I've gotten the watch a month ago, and even I guess you could say more so over the last week since the new firmware was released, and I haven't seen one correction whatsoever. On the flip side, though, from the new firmware standpoint, in terms of just general heart rate accuracy, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a night and day difference personally. Uh, where definitely. Yeah, 100%. where I mean, the results I had with the pre 2.0 or 2.0.19 firmware, not good, like not good at all. Like, I mean, basically what yeah. I got out of the Vantage V3, which makes a lot of sense, of course, but with this new 2.0 whatever firmware, uh, I would say that it's I would say good at this point for the most part. I did have one massive failure on a trail run uh, that I mentioned to you earlier, yep. but other than that, I'm getting actually very consistent results. I want to go ahead and do another trail run or two before publishing my review just to, you know, validate what exactly is going on there and make sure that it's consistent. But I would say whatever they did in terms of general heart rate accuracy seems to be working out for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. I'd say like uh, I had an interval run, I think on Friday or something a couple days ago. And um, it was a good example where it. It was generally quite good, um, and it barely beat the Epix Pro, which missed a single interval. One, uh, technically, the Epix Pro missed two intervals, but one interval was holding a camera, so that doesn't really count. Um, and so the second interval, though, was that was totally the Epix Pro's failure. So it's good. I think the difference in my head, I was thinking about this my run today, as I after I watched it just sit there at 180, right, when I'm standing, standing still for 30 seconds, is that... When you see other watches, and this is just isn't Garmin's watches, Apple, Epics, whatever, um, other watches do weird things. It's somewhat predictable as to when they're going to do weird things. Like mm. doing short, fast intervals, you know that if they're going to be late in on the start, um, and that'll pick up. That's what the Epics, when it failed this past uh, weekend or Friday, whatever it was, it missed the first like 20 seconds. Then it was like, oh, hold on, I know where I am. And then boom, it caught back in mid-interval and it was good to go, right? But still, it it failed where the, the Grid X2 um, did successfully catch on from the very beginning of that interval um, but it does recover more quickly what i'm seeing here though when the grid x2 pro fails it like just gives up like it's just it's like i am done with this for the day i am i am done competing today it's over that's um, pretty much what i'm actually experiencing <laughs> on my end too is that you know that trail run it was just like it wasn't even right like at all like it was like not even on the, <laughs> yeah. on the map yeah um but yeah talking about maps though I have to agree with the GPS accuracy. It's like, it's okay. I was using it against some single band satellite devices, to be yeah. honest with you, that did better um, than, yeah. I, I don't know. And this goes again to the fact that, you know, you're going to see this dual band or dual frequency satellite chipset uh, technology on, you know, pretty much any watch over $350 ish, I guess any new watch that's going to come out, uh, you know, around that three to $350 ish uh, price tag, but it's definitely not about just having the chipset that makes it more accurate. There's going to be the antenna design and there's going to be other factors that play into accuracy. And that's where you have some devices that have just single band chipsets that can do a better job just because uh, of just better algorithms, better antenna design, all that good stuff. So 
I know a lot of people like when they're comparing device to device, they're like, well, this one has dual band, so it's going to be more accurate. That's not necessarily the case out there. So, I mean, this is, I think, going to be a good example of that. No, I agree totally. Uh, and we saw that. I mean, certainly Polar um, was probably the unfortunate poster child for the very first dual band device they released with the Ignite 2, Ignite 3, I think, right? Um, having very rough... Uh, um, dual band, multi-band uh, GPS accuracy. And they, they admitted that when they got to the Vantage V3. In any case, setting that all aside, we then get to that third bucket of my review, which is sort of like, okay, we talked about general features on the watch. Do they work as expected? Sometimes. Accuracy? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, and then the third bucket is price to features ratio. And that is, I think, where myself and almost every reviewer out there has really just hit the wall on this and that especially over the last month right and i whether or not garmin time is this way i don't know but uh, you know they the same day the the grid x 2 pro was announced garmin dropped the price of their epics um you know gen 1 series or whatever you want to call them right the not the not pros down to was it 599 or something like that right yeah, at um, least yeah mm-hmm. yeah five, it was 549 599 right so 549 for the Epics uh, and then five ninety nine for the Sapphire edition. Um, and just to put that in perspective, that's like basically half of what it was when it first came out. So right, yeah. um, and the the Sapphire has multi band, right? So it's got like the the challenge there is that that price is cheaper than the Polar Grid X two. And it's got a gazillion more features. It's got better accuracy across the board um, from certainly from GPS, and I think also from optical heart rate sensor in most scenarios. Based on if I look at my testing over a longer periods of time, that's a very tough spot to be against. Like I don't. Uh, yeah, I would. It's I don't know. It's it's going to be really tough. Uh, funny enough, I would actually give harder accuracy to the Grid X2 Pro at this point versus my results from the original Epix uh, or the Epix Gen 2, whatever. Like the Epix Gen 2, it was like, it was decent and fine for most things, but um, I would actually have to give it to to the Grid X2 Pro for harder accuracy. Everything else though, it's the Epix. I mean, like from just a pure feature standpoint, I mean, you know, as you said, like whatever, two or three episodes ago, it's just got, it's just got like, nearly a hundred more features than the Polar Grid X2 Pro would have. Um, so yeah, and, and that's really, that's ultimately what is probably taking me the longest with wrapping up my review too, is kind of wrapping my head around the whole price strategy behind this, considering the other options that are out there. And, you know, even putting aside the epics for the moment, you know, we have to talk about like the Sunto Vertical and the Chorus Vertix 2. Those are generally around the same price range ish as the Grit X2 Pro, but you know, you toss the Sunto race into the equation, it just like that just like throws everything out the window. So I don't know, like I brought it up during our original Grit X2 Pro discussion that I almost feel that this pricing strategy is because of positioning in the marketplace more than anything else. I I just can't see how it's justifiable from a feature standpoint with the competition. That's the only that's the only uh, explanation I can come up with this at this point. Yeah, I, I agree. I would say in heart rate accuracy, perhaps my morning of horrific heart rate accuracy is scarring me a little bit um, from this morning. <laughs> um, what you typically have used, though, in the Epics, you were using the larger one most of the time, right? The, the no, largest. actually... No, 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 no. Actually, I guess uh, the it's original, Gen one, so yeah. yeah, 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 Gen, yeah, the Gen two, Gen two, not Pro, not Pro, yeah. It's such a mess. Not pro, That's a whole different. Yeah, not yeah. not Pro forty seven millimeter. Um, but yeah, okay. I was like, it was like, I don't know, it wasn't like fantastic to be honest with you yeah. on that. I watch. found it good for running, but like most things, it struggled on on the cycling side a bit here and there. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's basically it's Garmin's Gen four optical heart rate sensor, right? So it's used in mm-hmm. a million different devices they have. Um, yeah, I think on the feature side. It's really tough given this is a trail focused watch, right? It's an outdoor watch. And as one who just spent a lot of time in the outdoors on the trails using this side by side with the Garmin Epix, uh, you know, different wrists, but looking at how they compare, there was some bugs I ran into there as well. Um, that, so coming back to that first bucket of like things that should work, some bugs that are not yet fixed um, about showing me in the wrong spot on the trail profile. So it said I'd be at the top of a hill when I was at the base of a hill and vice versa. And so they're they're already digging into what's going on there, but it doesn't sound like it's, it's fixed at this point yet. Um, so that was a, a problem. 
But more than the the minor bugs was the fact that like just not having things like Climb Pro um, mm. for some of these long you know multi hour ascents. To me, if you're talking trail stuff, um, that's that's a bit frustrating. I will say that I did like they added the arrows to their their maps, oh, yeah. so that's a nice little touch um, mm -hmm. in the most recent firmware. Um, so that was nice, and the the top of detail is nice as well, of course. Uh, but I think again, you just compare it to the competition in these different areas, and this is where the death by a thousand cuts is very very tough for a lot of companies to compete here, where there's just so many little features that their competitors have that they become second nature, right? Climb Pro becomes second nature if you're spending a lot of times in the mountains, and once you start using it, you're like wow, how did I not mm -hmm. have this before? Um, and so I think, like you said, positioning for them might make sense, but it's really tough to justify that when people start comparing products. Um, and I'm not sure how that, and I feel like in some ways, sort of like the instinct was a couple of years ago, they just, they should have just waited a little longer. Like once they mm -hmm. delayed it, delay it a little bit more to clean up these minor bugs that we're not here sitting talking about i don't have sleep data for the last three days right or right mm -hmm. you know it said i was on one mountain ridge when i was still two thousand meters from you know or 1500 meters from the top of that ridge like that kind of stuff just needed to be to be sorted out yeah uh what's interesting is <laughs> ray and i were messaging before this podcast about the sleep data bug i i apparently have a unicorn watch because uh, i've Although it did miss one night out of the last week, I actually haven't experienced that bug. Like I still actually have boost and all that kind of stuff. Like just, I, maybe I just won't update my watch if I see a new, new firmware come out or something. But tomorrow, um, no boost for you. <laughs> exactly. I already recorded my B-roll, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. go at this point. That's yeah. the worst part for me is I didn't record the the boost stuff yet. Like I was like, oh, I'll get that tomorrow, and I say that every day, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, and now it just tells me sleep more, right? How do I I'm see my sleep forecast? Keep sleeping. Um, like I'm sleeping. getting, I'm getting to be a lot better at like, all right, if I see something, I'm just going to film it like immediately just cause yeah. like who knows what's going to happen. But yeah. So I don't know, like going back to the whole pooler, uh, pooler, the whole polar Sunto discussion about how they, you know, we kind of didn't hear from both of those companies for a long time. And then, you know, they, they made bigger splashes last year. That's where I think with Polar, they were kind of like last to get back into the whole like sports watch world with AMOLED, offline maps, all that kind of good stuff. And I think at this point, they may need to kind of uh, rethink their strategy in terms of pricing, uh, considering what else is on the market and that they're having to play catch up. And if they are playing catch up, that means they kind of really need to entice those other users. And at this point, I would actually give the Grid X2 Pro like a, I think it's a, I think it's a good watch. Is it like a great watch? Not necessarily, but um, you know, if they can reduce the pricing on it, I think that would help this watch considerably. Totally. Yeah. If they can, if they can bring that pricing down a fair bit, um, which means also bringing down the Vantage V3 pricing, right? Like that's the, yeah. They they need to bring back the pricing of what this used to be, right? It used to be what four ninety nine. I that? think so. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. So that's what they launched the Grid X One Pro, whatever it was at. And that same. <laughs> yeah. um, well, there was the pro, anyway. So that they need to bring it down to that ballpark, and they need to drop the the Vantage V3 pricing as well to make that effectively compete with like a 955-ish sort of thing, right? Or, mm. or compete with the Sunto race, like whatever they want to do there. Um, and that this has a minor upsell. And I know that people that get into materials are like, oh, but it has better materials and this and that. That matters to a much smaller fraction of the audience than I think most people uh, realize, right? There are some people, yeah. they want looks, but the actual materials, sapphire glass versus not, things like that, um, are secondary to do they have headliner features? Do they have accuracy? Do they have, you know, is it is it full of bugs? That kind of stuff. That, those mm -hmm. are the, the big ticket. Those the other things are are smaller. So uh, you actually just got back from your hike, your three day, four day, you know, crazy hike yep. with the uh, Grit X2 Pro. So let's see here. The question would be. If you had just that device and you did that hike, would you have come back alive? <laughs> Dude, would I have had a battery pack? Yes or no. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Yeah, yeah. So I had to have a battery pack. So that's probably one thing to note. So um, I was basically hiking 10 to 13 hours per day. And um, consistently each day I burned through 
half a battery, so a 50% of battery on it. And I would top it off each night because I just didn't want to get in a situation where I ran out of battery towards the end of the day. Um, mm-hmm. So I was using not always on display for both this and the Garmin Epics. So I configured the 47 mil Garmin Epics um, the same as the uh, Grid XG Pro in terms of not always on display on both of them, A the same course loaded from Commute on both of them. Um, and then I roughly kept them on either map screen or not map screen, depending on what I was doing. And most of the time it was actually not the map screen because I kind of knew where I was going. Um, it was the climb pro screen on the Garmin side and then the elevation profile um, or the uh, pace screens on the, the polar side. Um, so again, each day I was draining about 50% of the battery, which means that that put me on track for like 26 or so hours of battery life compared to the 40 they claim. But their claim for 40 or so is actually uh, not with navigation enabled and apparently now navigation kills that quite a bit um mm-hmm. so put that in the bucket for what it's worth the epics was actually relatively similar in battery though um in terms of they they almost were like within a percent or two of battery drain by the end of the day um so again that's for what it's worth as well for navigation uh i had no real problems with the um uh, the the polar unit in terms of following the trails and stuff like that it was really interesting though to see how Kamut um, sends tracks and how it shortens tracks uh, and shortens elevation profiles um, to hmm. both devices, actually. Because uh, I also had a couple of devices with me as well that use an adopted version of the Kamut track, where like if you run a Kamut track through Garmin Connect and then you make a copy of it, when you make a copy of a Kamut track in Garmin Connect, it recalculates all yeah. the elevation and it replots the GPS points correctly and that kind of stuff, right? Um, if you don't do that, it just uses it exactly as is from Kamut. Uh, and that data is quite as accurate um but i would have still gotten there on the the polar side no problems the lack of the profile being correct was a a bug and i i can i've narrowed down for polar exactly what that bug is and when it triggers and when it doesn't trigger on the the device so it should be easy for them to solve um especially since they have my files and all the debug information all that kind of stuff um but yes i would have gotten there at the end for me though for that many climbs as much climbing as i was doing i mean my entire three days of this every day was either going up or going down having climb pro was just super super valuable to know how much suffering i had left until i'd suffer some more going the other way right like it was (laughs) as simple as that yeah so are you gonna have uh your hike video done soon uh, cause we all want to hear about the actual adventure. I mean, we, we definitely yeah. want to hear your grit X2 pro review, but we want to hear about your adventure as well. Totally. Yeah, no, I've got, uh, so I shot an entire video the whole, the whole time. I've got all my stuff consolidated. It should be much easier for me to edit this one than my, uh, mock mock one, because one, it's only three days and not, uh, eight days. Hmm. And two, I learned a lot on, on that particular, the previous hike in terms of not having so many cameras. I shot virtually this entire thing on one camera plus a couple drones, which is just B roll type stuff. Uh, and like once or twice, if the camera ran low on batteries, my phone for something. So it's just much, much more consolidated. Um, but yeah, I think probably about two weeks out is my guess on that, give or take. Yeah. Well, we are definitely all looking forward to that because we saw your Instagram stories and it looked gorgeous there. Like, and where was that again? It was, that was a uh, Madeira. So I was in Madeira. Madeira. It's a Portuguese island off the coast of Africa. It was absolutely stunning. Uh, super, super <sighs> cool place to go. Um, yeah. You should have, you should have done that 30 hour flight to get there. No, I, you know, after seeing the photos and video, I, I regretted not saying yes to that very, very long <laughs> flight, but yeah, but there's a lot of travel coming up as you know. So it's, uh, yeah, I've got to like, I gotta be. <laughs> I think collectively everyone would have would have paid to see what your legs would have looked like each morning trying to get out of the tent. Like, <laughs> like the, the the trying to stand up aspect was so so painful every morning for me um, because of the descents. Like the ascents were fine, but it was yeah, the descents each day that just always. with a really heavy pack. I had a, a basically a forty four pound pack, so it's about twenty kilo pack, and. Uh, very very heavy full of bunch of tech crap um and so yeah that that really added up um but i would have been i would have been keen to see how that would have worked out cool so. yeah well cool uh so i think that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode so a uh, reminder that we should have our grit x2 pro final reviews out by the time this podcast come out. So if you haven't checked those out, we'll have those linked down in the description below. Ray should also have his Sennheiser Momentum Sport review out as well. And for the next episode, we have some new stuff to talk about, which should be kind of interesting. Maybe we'll talk about your hike a little yeah. bit more. 
and uh, whatever else that may come up. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, keep in mind that you can listen to this podcast on both Spotify as well as Apple Music, also YouTube Music. And in case of YouTube Music, you can both watch it on YouTube and then switch back and forth seamlessly to the audio side as well. All right. Thanks so much. And we'll see you in the next episode.